In 15 terrifying seconds, the San Francisco Bay Area is decimated by a massive earthquake. As fire threatens entire neighborhoods and bridges, buildings, and freeways collapse, rescuers try to save those in danger. I don't think any of us at the time were really considering what the risks were to us. In the rubble, dozens of lives hang in the balance. When it, everything goes bad, what do they call? They call the fire department. For the victims to survive, emergency personnel must put their lives on the line to make critical rescues. California's San Andreas Fault is the most studied fault line in the world. In September 1989, scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey detected a series of minor earthquakes. The data led them to predict a devastating earthquake would strike sometime between that moment and the next 30 years. There was no way to predict the impending quake with more accuracy. Yes, it's not looking good. It was a threat people in the San Francisco Bay Area lived with every day, but rarely thought about. On Tuesday, October 17th, 1989, most people in the region were thinking about the third game of the World Series. A sellout crowd of 54,000 baseball fans packed Candlestick Park to watch the San Francisco Giants take on their Cross Bay rivals, the Oakland Athletics. It was billed as the Battle of the Bay. Each city rooted for its home team. 23-year-old Treasure Island firefighter Tim Peterson was undivided in his loyalty. I'm an A's fan. And yeah, I've always followed the A's. I have no interest in the San Francisco Giants. Peterson was on his way back to the fire station after running an errand. Traffic on the Cypress Expressway and the Bay Bridge was unusually light. There was no traffic that day. It was because of the the ball game. I definitely wanted to get back to work to, to watch the game. If all went well, Peterson might make it back for the opening pitch. Mom, I don't want braces. Kids will tease me. You're really going to have a gorgeous smile. In Oakland, Petra Baruman drove her 10-year-old daughter Kathy home from the orthodontist. Eight-year-old Julio shared the back seat with his sister. Up front, his mother and a friend listened to the game as they headed home on the lower deck of the Cypress Expressway. In the Marina District, longtime San Francisco resident Shara Cox had just moved into a new apartment. Although she was still unpacking, she'd already set up her most prized possession, her baby grand piano. Shara loved playing waltzes. Few things could pull her away from her music after a long day at work. But that Tuesday was different. The World Series was beginning. And so was the Loma Prieta earthquake. Shara braced herself under a door frame. It was the safest place in the house. All around her, the building began to shake. The entire Bay Area was gripped by a massive earthquake. 
In a matter of seconds, freeways buckled, bridges collapsed, and buildings were shaken from their foundations. At Candlestick Park, the lives of 54,000 fans hung in the balance. Tim Peterson was on the Cypress Expressway when the quake struck. It was like I'd, I'd hit something and I had four flat tires because the truck was just completely out of control. And that lasted for probably a second. And then it was complete black. The devastation was unimaginable. In 15 seconds, the 7.1 earthquake destroyed a mile and a half of the Double Decker Expressway. Thousands of tons of concrete slammed down onto the lower deck, crushing vehicles and the people in them. Julio and Kathy Baruman were trapped, along with her mother and her friend. The destruction was so fast and widespread that authorities had a hard time getting an accurate picture of the devastation. 911, San Francisco emergency. I need to know, did any, uh, I just heard that something happened to the Bay Bridge. I heard that too. I, I can't confirm it. Do you know if there was anything serious? My dad was supposed to be coming home. Honey, I'm not going to scare you. I don't know yet. All I heard is the upper deck collapse. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not, okay? Okay. Authorities would soon confirm the quake had severed the main artery between Oakland and San Francisco, the Bay Bridge. 275,000 vehicles crossed the bridge each day. Now, a section of the upper deck had fallen onto the lower deck. About four seconds into it, we turned around because we were going to run through the playground, and we saw this go, and it just quietly collapsed. It was so eerie. The Marina District, Shara Cox's neighborhood, was hit hardest by the quake. Because it was built on marshland, the marina's soil is prone to a phenomenon known as liquefaction. Vibrations from the quake literally turned the soil to liquid. The liquefied soil gave way, unable to support buildings. Many structures tumbled to the ground. Gas lines ruptured and the fires began to spread. Shara Cox's building had collapsed. The top three stories crashed down on top of her, pinning her under a door. Station nine of the San Francisco Fire Department was besieged by calls. Early on, it was difficult to learn the scope of the destruction. Jerry Shannon called his wife and children to make sure they were okay. Then he went to work. Most firemen took this job for one reason, and they want to do it. So when they call you, there's doors open, and, and off you go, and you do what you need to do. Their radios were overloaded with traffic, making it difficult to receive reports or dispatches. Station 9 implemented a special contingency plan. You go into the emergency mode where you circle your area to see uh, and kind of radiate out from the firehouse to see what kind of damage is in your immediate area. As the crew of Truck 9 searched for damage, they received a radio call diverting them across the city. The Marina District was in trouble. With power out in most of the city, traffic lights didn't work. Roads were clogged by stalled electric buses and panicked motorists. Crucial time was being lost. Lives were in danger. 25 minutes later, the crew of Engine 9 got their first glimpse of the marina. The picturesque neighborhood had become an inferno. As we got over the top of Fillmore Street, um, you could see the mushroom cloud, a lot of building collapse, broken glass, wires down. 
Most buildings in the district were heated with natural gas. When the buildings collapsed, the lines exploded. At Pacific Gas and Electric, service technicians were dispatched to shut down the gas mains. Crew foreman Jack Dietzen was one of the PG&E technicians who rushed to the marina. Stemming the flow of gas was critical to controlling the fire. If gas uh, accumulates inside a building, then uh, the potential of an explosion is uh, really increased. If it finds a flame like a pilot light that uh, might be still left on, if that service or gas main is not turned off, uh, it could explode. As the fires raged, rescuers faced an additional threat. There's always aftershocks in a major quake, and they expected aftershocks in this. Each aftershock has the potential to cause new damage and further collapse. Many residents panicked and fled. Others stayed behind to help reinforce buildings in case survivors were trapped inside. Shara Cox was still trapped in the rubble of her building. She heard someone pass by looking for survivors. Hello? Hello? The weight of the debris on her chest made it difficult to shout. Densely packed rubble muffled her cries for help. The rescue worker moved on. Shara Cox was just 30 feet away. She had to find some way to get their attention. She found a metal pipe in the wreckage. It was her only hope. To keep the noise from sounding random, she added a distinctly human touch. She banged out a waltz rhythm. Inside the building, the fires were spreading. If someone didn't hear her soon, Shara would be burned alive. Across the bay in Oakland, Tim Peterson faced a similar fate. His truck had been crushed by tons of concrete from the upper deck of the Cypress Freeway. It was a miracle he was even alive. And it was a bench seat, so there was no console area. When it hit, I just kind of fell over to the right uh, where the passenger would be. He had survived the catastrophe, but barely. He was now pinned onto the dash of his truck. His broken ribs punctured one of his lungs. With no sign of a rescue crew, Tim Peterson resigned himself to dying. I would figured there were so many things wrong that, you know, there was, you know, I was never going to survive through this thing. Peterson's fate was closely intertwined with that of Julio and Kathy Baruman. As aftershocks rocked the damaged Cypress Freeway, they hoped someone would find them before it collapsed completely. On October 17, 1989, the San Francisco Bay Area was hit by a massive earthquake. Freeways and bridges had collapsed. Buildings were leveled. 
every emergency worker in the area was dispatched. But it wasn't enough. They were overwhelmed by the growing catastrophe. All over the city, citizens pitched in to help. In the marina district, fires raged. To a veteran firefighter like Jerry Shannon, it was a worst case scenario. In San Francisco, it's unique, not just the capacity of the buildings, you know, the fuel load, they're all wood, they're right next door to each other. Um, multi-residential, four and five story wood buildings with no space in between. And a lot of them are older in the marina. They don't have sprinkler systems and being fed by the gas, broken gas mains, this was a tinder box. The firefighters needed to get water on the blaze before it spread through the entire district. They were pulling hose off and running down to the next block and the block after it and hooking up, opening the hydrants, nothing. And there was just no water to be had. All the mains were broken. None of the hydrants worked. The fire crews would have to improvise. How about the Palace yeah. of Fine Arts? Going down the museum was four blocks away. It had a small pond. The San Francisco Fire Department would bring water to the marina by any means necessary. Countless lives depended on it. As fire threatened to engulf the neighborhood, quake victims like Shara Cox were still trapped in rubble. Across the damaged Bay Bridge in Oakland, there weren't enough emergency workers to handle the disaster. As in San Francisco, Oakland citizens pitched in to help fire and rescue teams. Volunteers dared to climb between the two decks of the collapsed Cypress Freeway to look for survivors. The unstable structure creaked and groaned under tons of steel and concrete. For the rescuers, it was a constant reminder their lives were on the line. In the twisted wreckage of flattened cars, death was everywhere. A rescuer found the bodies of two adult women crushed in the front seat of an SUV. In the back seat were two children. Kathy and Julio Baruman were alive. Both children were trapped and gravely injured. I'll be back with help. Just stay right there, I promise you, okay? The rescuer ran to get help. Oh, God. In San Francisco, firefighters rigged portable pumps to siphon water from a pond. It was a slow and time-consuming process, but it was their only option. They had a hose tender, which is loaded with portable hydrants and large five-inch line, supply lines, on their way out to the marina. It was a start, but the lagoon would soon run dry. If they hoped to save the marina and find Shara Cox and the other survivors in time, they'd need more water. Oakland firefighters responded to a citizen's report of two trapped children in the wreckage of the 880 freeway. The rescuers crawled through the unstable structure. At any moment, an aftershock could send tons of steel and concrete crashing down on top of them. Kathy and Julio were trapped in the wreckage of the family car. 
It would take hours of work to free them. A mile away, under the smoldering wreckage of the freeway, Tim Peterson was pinned inside his truck. My legs were so crushed that I, I figured I'd never be able to use them again. I could feel there was a real problem with, with the legs. Peterson couldn't hear if anyone was searching for him. He heard only the sounds coming from the demolished cars all around him. The sounds afterwards were the horns blaring, the engines revving, and you could hear people screaming. Further down the collapsed freeway, the Oakland Fire Department used a hydraulic tool known as the Jaws of Life to free the two children from the wreckage. They had to work quickly. 10-year-old Kathy and 8-year-old Julio Baruman were going into shock. After an hour and a half of work, they freed Kathy. She had sustained major head injuries. She would be transported to a nearby hospital where she would undergo eight hours of surgery for a fractured skull, smashed cheekbones, and a broken jaw. Her brother Julio's situation was more dire. His legs were pinned under the seats. His right leg was crushed. Firemen couldn't remove him from the vehicle. They needed a doctor if they had any chance of saving him. The staff of Oakland's Children's Hospital watched news reports of the Cypress Freeway collapse. Dr. James Betts, director of trauma services for the hospital, prepared for a busy night. So we readied ourselves to receive all of these patients. And over the course of the next hour, no one came. So we had no injured children, no injured adults. And yet we knew there were people who were trapped on this freeway. Dr. Betts phoned Oakland police and offered his assistance. They sent a car to rush him to the Cypress Freeway. In the Marina District, the fires began consuming structures near Sherrick Cox's collapsed apartment building. She never ceased tapping out a persistent waltz beat. The effort seemed to pay off. The man who heard the banging noise in the wreckage informed fire personnel. The smell of natural gas was overpowering. Jerry Shannon peered through the debris, looking and listening for any signs that someone could have survived the building's collapse. Then he heard something. Is anybody in here? Anybody in here? As he moved through the debris, Jerry Shannon couldn't be sure where the sound was coming from. Anybody in here? I'm here. Here. A series of wooden beams prevented him from going any further. Can you hear me? Hello? I'm here! I'm here! Okay, I'm gonna have to go back and get a chainsaw. If you keep talking, I'll crawl to where your voice is. I'll He'd have to find a way to cut through the debris and beams if the rescue was to be successful. By cutting them, he'd risk collapsing the tunnel which could take both of their lives. I had no idea whether we were going to get her out. I mean, with all the stuff that had come down on her, um, I had no idea. 
whether it was going to be a successful rescue. In addition to the risk of collapse, Jerry Shannon would have to face both fire and aftershocks if he was to save the woman's life. A massive earthquake, measuring 7.1 on the Richter scale, hit the San Francisco Bay Area. It leveled buildings and freeways. In Oakland, tons of concrete fell from the Cypress Expressway. Dozens of cars on the lower deck were crushed. An hour later, a volunteer crawled through the wreckage, looking for survivors. He found firefighter Tim Peterson wedged in the crushed cab of his pickup truck. He was severely injured. The space was less than three feet high. But if you can imagine, something's crushed like that, so the steering wheel is now conformed over your lap and down by the pedals and all that. Your ankles are just mangled in there. So there's no really moving that part. So if you really can't move your legs, it's kind of hard to move your torso much. To give Peterson more room, the volunteer tried to lower the truck by slashing its tires. The tactic seemed to work. There was now a two-inch gap between the concrete and the truck. But after a few moments, the gap closed. The concrete was just settling to where it wanted to settle, and there was no stopping it. The man who found Peterson summoned nearby Oakland firemen for help. Just being there, Oakland firefighter Victor Cuevas was putting his life at risk. When we got up there, just the smell of gasoline and all the gas that was around us. And you're in a confined space, and you're thinking, well, if there's an ignition source somewhere nearby, all the fumes, the way they're laying around, you know, we're, 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 we're in a bit of trouble. Then the thought occurred, well, that's the least of our problem. If the earthquake, if we get another aftershock, and if the freeway decides to completely crumble, then we're, we're all goners. In San Francisco's marina, natural gas fuel fires continued to burn. There was no end to the work for crew foreman Jack Dietzen and other service technicians. The gas lines in the marina were underground, and uh, you couldn't see the brakes. You could see the brakes in the sidewalk, but you couldn't see broken pipes. The, the sidewalks were buckled uh, three feet in the air. The mains were cracked and uh, the services were broken and uh, that whole system had to be shut down and that, that had to take some time. Despite the effort to stem the flow of gas, fire continued to threaten the marina. And the fire department had little water to fight it. Firefighters were concerned about igniting gas that lingered in the rubble of Shara Cox's apartment. You could smell the gas. It was thick when we got down there, and they tell you don't even key your radio because any spark can set it off. To reach Shara Cox in time, firemen had to cut through the debris quickly. A chainsaw was the only tool for the job. They didn't want us to take the chainsaw in there because they said if you hit a nail in the floor, it could ignite the gas. Jerry Shannon began the risky operation of cutting through the beams that prevented him from reaching Shara Cox. I was cutting a little more than shoulder width sections out of the floor joists because the three floors that came down the floor above Shara's apartment had these floor joists and uh, they were blocking the way and I was passing the pieces that I cut back to the guys behind me. Even as he cut through the debris 
Jerry Shannon couldn't be sure where Shera Cox was in the rubble. I followed her voice, and I was asking her, where were you when it collapsed? And she said, I was in the hallway, and I said, we're in relation, where's the hallway? And she was saying, it's in the you know, southwest corner, and I was just kind of crawling to where she was talking. And she hadn't seen the outside of the building. She didn't know it was three floors on top of her. Between the two decks of the collapsed Cypress Freeway structure in Oakland, Dr. James Betts got his first glimpse at eight-year-old Julio Baruman. His condition was precarious and dire. His right leg was trapped under the front seat. He had been sitting in the back seat and at the time of the impact had been thrown forward, both of his legs going under each of the front seats. And when the upper deck fell, the cross beam of concrete supporting the upper deck came right down onto the front of the car, instantly killing the two adults in the front seat. So his right leg was crushed and trapped from his knee down. His left leg was pinned from his mid-hip down. Several large fans were brought in to reduce the sweltering 95 degree temperatures in the structure. The fans also helped clear any potentially explosive gasoline fumes. Firefighters worked frantically to free Julio's left leg. With Julio's right leg crushed under tons of concrete, Dr. James Betts would have to perform a heartbreaking task. I knew as soon as I saw him, we would have to amputate his right leg at the level of the knee. But Dr. Betts discovered access to Julio's leg was blocked by the body of his mother's friend in the front passenger seat. We couldn't maneuver underneath the front seat to get to his leg in a way that would allow me to amputate his leg. We needed to divide her body in order to get to him. To make matters worse, there were signs that the structure might not hold out. Every several minutes, there was an aftershock, so you could feel the whole structure shake. A number of authorities and, and people on the ground were telling our crew to leave that structure. But we had all decided that we felt, as long as Julio was still alive, that we were all going to stay there until we extricated him. Firefighters in the Marina District struggled to keep the entire neighborhood from going up in flames. Broken water mains meant water was scarce. The department's Phoenix fireboat was called in to tap another water source, the San Francisco Bay. The crew anchored at the Marina Harbor. Hoses were run a half mile to the neighborhood. Phoenix would pump millions of gallons of seawater to quell the flames that roared in the marina district. As Shara Cox lay trapped under three stories of rubble, the structure across the street from her burst into flames. Firefighter Jerry Shannon was cutting a tunnel through the debris. As he prepared to cut through the last beam, his chainsaw gave out. He'd have to leave her while he got another. He gave her his flashlight to assure her he'd be back. But Shara Cox was terrified. She was still trapped, and the fires were closing in by the minute. Hours after an earthquake sent the top deck of the Cypress Freeway crashing down on the lower deck, 
eight-year-old Julio Baruman lay trapped in the crushed remains of an SUV. Dr. James Betts and Oakland firemen were faced with a gruesome task. To reach Julio's leg, they would have to cut the dead body in the front passenger seat in half. Aftershocks threatened to collapse the structure further. With the situation urgent, Dr. Betts needed a tool that could work faster than any surgical instrument. It was a totally surreal, horrifying, uh, frightening situation. That number one, we were doing this, and number two, I was worried that we were going to further injure the child who was still alive. While the woman's body was being cleared from the vehicle, firemen successfully freed Julio's left leg. Now, Dr. Betts was able to reach Julio's right leg. He prepared to perform the amputation. Dr. Betts needed to work quickly if he was to save Julio. We had started another intravenous line, had given him intravenous fluids, had given him some pain medication. At this point, his blood pressure was falling. I knew he had lost a significant amount of blood from the crush injury to his, his other leg. Uh, I was very, very concerned at that point. All sorts of complications can occur. In another section of the Cypress Freeway, firemen were trying to free Tim Peterson from his truck. They needed the jaws of life, but in the aftermath of the quake, the tool was in high demand. Oakland firefighter Victor Cuevas would have to find another way to get inside. Initially, you look at the situation and you figure out the tools that you need. And then they tell you that those tools aren't available. You know, you just can't sit there and do nothing until they make the tools available because that may be, you know, two hours, three hours, or it may never happen. Firemen found an ordinary tire jack and saw in the wreckage. They used them in an attempt to force open the truck's door. We figured we can pop the door and probably maneuver them out. But once we popped the door, we seen how the uh, dashboard and the steering wheel was right on top of them. Peterson had an inch or two of room to spare in the truck cab. Tremors and aftershocks were threatening to eliminate even this meager space. With the imminent threat of collapse, Tim Peterson was desperate to get out, not just for himself, but for the men risking their lives to save him. He suggested they amputate his legs. We just calmed him down and reassured him that uh... You know, we we're going to get him out in one piece. That's, that was our main objective, to get him out in one piece. A mile away, Dr. James Betts was amputating eight-year-old Julio Baruman's right leg. He used only local anesthesia, a shot of Novocaine, into the boy's knee. Dr. Betts had to perform the operation while crouching. He could barely see what he was doing. For all your practice in medicine, you make a decision, especially in surgery, and then you go ahead and, and, and follow through with that. Um, for him, I was hesitating because I knew that he was in a very fragile, frail situation. I knew if I didn't quickly amputate his leg and get control of his blood vessels, he would die. In San Francisco's Marina District, time was also running out for Jerry Shannon to save Shara Cox. The building across the street was on fire, 
and ignited the debris of Shara's building. Jerry had spent three hours cutting a narrow crawl space to reach her. He couldn't see what was happening outside, but sensed imminent danger. Things got hotter and brighter. The ceiling actually dropped about six inches from the weight of the water. Um, so I was just trying to go as fast as I could because we had no time. 30 feet into the rubble, Jerry Shannon made his first visual contact with Shara Cox. At that point, I could actually see her, and I leaned over the top, and we were face to face. And uh, she asked me about the water. She said, well, they're going to drown me before you get me out of here. The thousands of gallons of water being poured on the building to contain the fire was proving to be as big a threat to Shara's life as the fire itself. Jerry Shannon gave her his jacket to shield her from the water, but the water level continued to rise. As the fire raged out of control, Jerry had to make a decision. Have the water shut off and risk fire, or keep the water flowing and risk drowning Shara. Cut the water! Jerry, cut the water. Cut the water. He ordered the water shut off. The impact of his decision was almost immediate. Debris near the crawl space was catching fire. As the building threatened to burst into flames, firemen shouted into the crawl space, begging Jerry to get out while he still could. She told me she could hear what they were saying outside. They're thinking they don't want two victims and we're thinking we're not leaving without her. Hours after a 7.1 earthquake hit the San Francisco Bay Area, fires were consuming two structures next to the collapsed building where Shara Cox lay trapped under three stories of rubble. With the building about to be consumed by flames, fireman Jerry Shannon refused to give up. After nearly three and a half hours, Jerry Shannon had at last reached Shara Cox. But he couldn't budge the door on top of her. A heavy beam made it impossible to move. There was a bunch of stuff on top that I said, I'm gonna have to cut the door in half. So I took the chainsaw and I says, I started to cut the door. She said, hold it, I, I'm, I, this is me under the door put my hand under the door so I could feel the heat of the blade coming through. So as, as I cut through, I could feel the splinters coming down, and she had about an inch or two buffer between the door and her body. Um, and her eyes were as big as silver dollars. With the building's debris igniting, they had seconds to move her. Shara Cox later endured surgery for a crushed pelvis and a broken hip. put her on the gurney, and they started moving towards the ambulance. Then all of a sudden there was, she wasn't going in the ambulance. She had her hands braced against the, uh, the door, and uh, the paramedic came back and said, she's not gonna get in the ambulance till she gets your name. So I, I went up and I told her my name, and she goes, you're my hero. At that point, they put her in the ambulance and closed the door and they wheeled her away, away she went, and uh, we went back to work. Oakland firefighters were running out of time as they fought to free Tim Peterson from his crushed pickup truck.
Finally, they were able to push the dash back and widen the cab's crushed metal. After five hours of perilous work, they extricated Tim Peterson from the pickup. We strapped him down to the backboard and moved him down via that platform that they had there at the structure down to the ambulance where they, where they immediately took him to the hospital. Tim Peterson was in critical condition. He was treated for dozens of injuries, including a broken back. A mile away from the rescue of Tim Peterson, Dr. James Betts was trying to free eight-year-old Julio Baruman by amputating his crushed leg. And I couldn't really see very clearly that whole area where his leg was trapped, but I was doing it, feeling it with my hands. And as I divided his leg, I couldn't get control of the major blood vessel that goes from your hip down to your leg, down to your foot. With any kind of instrument, I had to grab it with my fingers because I knew he would bleed to death. And as we pulled him back out of the car, I was able to clamp all these blood vessels off and wrap his leg up as best I could in a bandage. Julio Baruman was rushed to the hospital where the amputation procedure was finished. In all, Julio would endure over 40 operations. He was later fitted with a prosthetic limb. His sister, Kathy, also experienced significant medical interventions, including having her jaw wired shut for nearly two months. Shara Cox continues to live in San Francisco, and she still keeps in touch with Jerry Shannon. Today, he's one of the dearest, bestest, nicest, sweetest, friends I have ever had. He's still my hero, and he always will be. Tim Peterson made a full recovery and now works for the Oakland Fire Department with the men who saved him. When it was over, the Loma Prieta earthquake claimed 67 lives. Nearly 4,000 people were injured. The third game of the 1989 World Series was eventually played. Life in the Bay Area went on. But those who lived through the quake will never forget it. I think for me, the frailty of human life here on this earth is something that, that stays with me always. Uh, to think that nature could reach up and grab human mankind by the nape of the neck and shake everything around, not only destroying all of these structures that we built, highways and buildings that are to last forever, and we realize that in 15 seconds we're totally destroyed, as well as taking human life, that we realize how, how frail our existence is. And for this period of time that we're here on this earth, I think you have to respect the time that you're here and, and live life to its fullest. Today, San Francisco Bay Area residents live with the threat of an equally devastating earthquake striking at any moment.